Unfortunately, most people will never experience the depths that some in our society do. Those individuals struggle every day with demons insurmountable, or so they think. Hello, I'm PJ Souls. Dr. Corey Gonzalez has been helping these people out of their personal nightmares. Dr. Corey, a cancer survivor who knows personally about ups and downs, has been a licensed clinical psychologist for over 18 years. He is not a newcomer to the field of media psychology with his experiences on Animal Planet's confessions, animal hoarding, as well as local TV and radio. He has a unique ability to get to the heart of an issue. First, 23-year-old Brooke has been a stripper for two years over her friend's objections. She feels that there is no other way to earn money, at least the kind of money that she's used to, which can amount to several hundred dollars in tips on a good night. But is this really the kind of life that she deserves? Brooke's mother had several affairs and left Brooke's father for someone else when Brooke was still very young, leaving her father to raise her alone. He began molesting her at age 12. Her father mentally abused her as well, telling her that she was a little whore and that she was pathetic and worthless. Because of this, she did actually begin to feel this way and set out to prove her father right. It wouldn't be a stretch to say that her father passed her around like a rag doll to his brother, cousin, and his own friends. Through all of that, Brooke never went to the authorities, even after her father took her to a clinic for an abortion at age 15, claiming she was older. Until now, she has never sought out any psychological treatment. Her friend has convinced her to seek the help of Dr. Corey. Come on in. Have a seat on the couch, get comfortable, and Dr. Corey will be right with you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good morning. Hi. You must be Brooke. I am. Nice to meet you, Dr. You Corey. Well. Nice to meet you. Seek it comfortable. Thank you. Well, Brooke, sounds like an interesting story and in, in what's led you to my office. Tell me a little bit about that. <sighs> Honestly, I, I don't know that I need to be here. I, I feel like it's unnecessary, but um, I, I have... This, this guy, I mean, I'm sure you know, I, he, he's trying to help me get out of what I'm doing, I guess, and, and better myself, move on. Obviously, I can't be a dancer forever, um, but he said the first step is coming to see you, so I So guess. I've been recommended by this guy? Yes, okay. you have. Well, I can't confirm or deny who, uh, who other people I see, uh, but I appreciate right. the insight. Yeah. And, and not uncommon, uncommon, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So tell me a little bit about, um, so right now you're dancing, you're stripping. Yes, I am. Okay. And, um, but a part of you feels like you want to stop stripping. Well, I mean, obviously I can't strip when I'm 40. I mean, that's probably not very attractive. Right. <laughs> probably wouldn't make as good money then. Right. So, I mean, I'm looking for something better, I guess. Okay. You know, one of the interesting things, Brooke, is, is oftentimes, first of all, I want to let you know I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to understand you. And I always look at these situations. I always want to kind of understand how we got here. And I want to understand a little bit about what stripping symbolizes to you. Okay. Kind of what you get from stripping. Um. <laughs> hmm. Power, I guess. Brooke's stripping behavior has met a need for her. And that need is to feel empowerment with men, something she never felt as a child, when she felt powerless and abused, and a way to become independent for men. Those are two roles that stripping has played for her. However, those roles are not healthy, and I think she knows that now. There's other ways of becoming empowered, and there's other ways of being independent. It's nice being able to choose when, when I get to take my top off or when I 
you know, when I expose myself, when, when people see me, like I get to pick that. I get to, I get to say when. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love the, the attention mm-hmm. from my customers and mm-hmm. especially my regulars, you mm-hmm. know, they're, they're good to me and I like that. Interesting things you brought up and that is the, the choice of when you share certain parts of yourself, personal parts of yourself. Tell me why you think that's so important to you. <laughs> um, I haven't always had the choice, I guess. You mentioned the word power. Is there a time in your life you felt powerless? Yeah. Growing up, childhood, formative years, teen, teenage years. I mean, um, up until I moved out, I, I didn't have power. I, my my dad, um, he, he had the power. He got to say when things happened and how they happened and... Did your dad abuse you? Yeah. I was his toy, basically. I, I was there for whatever, whatever he needed, whether it was an emotional punching bag or sexual relief, um, something to pass around to his friends. It was very difficult. Emotionally at first, and I was worthless, pathetic, a whore. And then um, sexually. I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's not okay. No. Debbie, a 27 year old heroin addict, struggles every day just to survive. She has been in and out of rehab for several years, but to no avail. Rehabs where 7 out of 10 fail to recover. At an early age, Debbie felt abandoned and unloved by her parents. As an adolescent, she would sneak cough medicine, and it went downhill from there. She would cut classes to drink, coming home blitzed, but covering well enough to not be discovered by her parents. She moved on to prescription pills, Secanol, Darvon, Talwin, anything she could scrounge. At 19, she met an older man named Raymond, who introduced her to heroin. She finally found what she was looking for. Unfortunately, Raymond began insisting on sexual favors, and it devolved from there. Recently, Debbie sold all of her grandmother's major appliances from her kitchen for some drugs while her grandmother was at work one day. At their wit's end, her family has requested that Dr. Corey intervene. Debbie, do you have any idea why I'm here today? No. Your family's very concerned about you. Do you think they have reasons to be? No. Okay. Do you think you're healthy right now? I'm fine. You're fine? Yeah. Have you ever been in this position before? Yeah. Tell me about that. Some people can use. So what you're telling me is you think you can dabble with this stuff? I think that I'm supposed to live my life this way. Yeah. Do you think it affects your functioning? I think it makes me normal. Normal. Do you think you have an ability to have relationships with people as long as you're chasing? I don't want to have relationships with people. I see. So that's why we're here. I guess. I imagine you didn't just come here at random. I imagine there's reasons why you don't want relationships with people. I don't want relationships with people. Do you think you were born that way? Yeah. And I never really had any friends. I also understand you were abandoned as, young, as a young age and uh, there's a lot of neglect with your parents as well. 
My childhood was, I don't remember a lot of it. I blocked a lot of it out. But I know I spent a lot of time alone in my room writing. My mom and dad fought a lot. My mom and dad fought a lot. Usually about me, whether I was gonna be able to go to school or not. I feel a lot of guilt from my childhood because I feel like my mom and dad wouldn't have stayed together if I hadn't been born. They would have parted ways a long time before. Then my mother got pregnant and they had to stay together because of me. So I remember hearing them fighting. I remember hearing them get violent. They just never cared about me. Nobody has. But I used to. And when did that change? When I stopped f***ing him. It was all he ever wanted. And what did you want? Heroin. Heroin was that unconditional love. Something never leave you, something you could rely upon. Something you get a certain constancy from, something you never got in your childhood, huh? It just makes everything okay. It's just what I need. Yeah. What do you expect your family to do? Sit back and watch you do this to yourself? They never cared anyway. They're just doing this so the neighbors don't give them weird looks. More because they had to, more because the neighbors were looking at them, not because they actually cared. But it's, it's crazy, I feel, I feel good now. And this is why you use? I use because I want to. You think it's a choice? Yes. You don't think you're addicted? Debbie is resisting every inch of the way. No. I used to wake up in the morning and I would get my bag and I would get my spoon and I would get a candle. I would get my needles. You know, I was blocking myself from my true heart, from what I really wanted, from where I really wanted to go. Let me ask you a question. What's the longest time you've ever gone without heroin? Two days. How'd that feel? What do you think it felt? It felt like I was gonna die. Scary, huh? Debbie, those, those feelings that you're so afraid of, that withdrawal, is serious stuff. Yeah, I know. And you need medical attention to come off this stuff. Some of the medications that are used in the medical settings will help people deal with withdrawals from heroin. Suboxone, so Ativan, these are medications that can help not only with the withdrawals, but also from the side effects. We can provide you some treatment. I don't want treatment. I don't want treatment. I don't want help. All right? Just leave me. Just leave me be. Just. You're very sick right now. You need medical attention. You need to get in a recovery program. You need to get well. I don't want to get well. What kind of life is there outside of this? Nothing that I want. There's nothing that I want outside of this room. There's nothing that I want outside of this life. But right now you're in the midst of a heroin addiction and nothing looks good. The only thing you're thinking about is a heroin. It preoccupies you and that's the only thing you can think about right now. And it is hell. But with some recovery and get you the proper program and get you some clarity and get you healthy again, the world can be yours. You can open up new doors. Addiction.
Debbie has since contacted her family and has agreed to meet with the doctor one more time. First of all, Debbie, I'm glad you've come back. You seem to be in a better place. Debbie, I want you to know something. I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to understand you and try to help you. And I, I believe that there is some reason, something you're getting from this behavior, this addiction. I, I'm, I have to believe there's something that, that, that's functional. It may be dysfunctional, but there's some purpose for you using this drug. What's going on? I, I know heroin will make me feel better. You know, I grew up without a lot of love. I wanted to be a, a daughter. Right. And loved. Do you think there's anything wrong with that need as, as a child to want that love, to be cared for? No. Do you see what role this drug and this addiction, this behavior is fulfilling? I just like having something. I just like... I don't know, I spent a lot of time by myself. Right. Growing up. And for me, when I started drinking, it was just, it was really nice to know that I could go in my room and drink. I started drinking pretty young. <laughs> that also makes you forget. It was mine. It was my. This is my body. This is how I want to feel. Right. You could depend on that. That's the one thing that was reliable in your life, because obviously you didn't have that with your parents, your primary attachments. No. I imagine it also kind of buffers you from some feelings that you probably never want to feel again. I get really, really upset when I heard my mom and dad fight. How did they respond to that? They didn't. They were too preoccupied with themselves. So there were some real empathic failures there. They didn't really respond to your emotional needs as a child. My mom used to tell me not to cry. It meant that I was weak. It meant that I couldn't control myself. And I used to get really, really nervous. At night when I heard them fighting because I wasn't sure if, you know, how hard he was, he was going to hit her. No. No, it's not, but, I don't know. It's what it was, I guess. How do you think that's impacted you? Um, it, it's, it's led me to where I'm at, I guess. I mean, it, um, I don't know. It, it made me want to be the person I am. Mm -hmm. I mean, a person with power, a person with choices. Yeah. A person in control. Yeah. 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 I want you to realize something. I don't know if you've ever thought of this before or anyone's ever told you before, but none of that abuse was your fault. Sometimes I knew that. Look, no child can consent to sexual relationship. No child is responsible for sexual abuse. I know it's very confusing. But it's people you trust or people that may, you know, make you feel certain feelings or stimulate you. Pedophiles are very well calculated. And I just want to let you know it's not your fault. And I know there's inherently, with people go through abuse, sometimes they feel shame. 
but no child is responsible for abuse. He said, sometimes you feel that. Yeah. yeah. I imagine you're kind of conflicted because your current lifestyle, there's some parallels. Yeah. Do you know what those parallels are? Um, I don't know. There's, there's secrets. Yeah. There's a dirty component. There's exploitation. There's a power difference. This, this lifestyle can sometimes keep that abuse alive. What Brooke is doing is she's basically keeping the past alive. There's so many parallels between what she experienced as a child and what's happening now. Now, she may not be the person that's powerless or the child that's being abused, but now she's more of an empowering figure. At some point in our lives, we have to st stop these cycles of dysfunction and abuse. It's very important for her to try to realize what she's doing she cannot recreate these scenarios and fix herself. She has to accept what's happened so that she can put in the rearview mirror and not give it any more life. As long as she's stripping, there's going to be a parallel between keeping her abuse and her trauma alive and getting well. I don't feel exploited. I, I, I'm making the choice to do this. But there is exploitation in what you're doing, is what I'm saying. Now, you may not feel like you're the one being exploited, but what I'm saying is that you've been down here, now you're up here, trying to create some kind of homeostasis. When are you going to be done with that? Isn't that what life's about? Isn't that all of life? It is, Brooke, when we're not psychologically minded, when, we, when we're not reflective, when we don't take inventory, we unconsciously just do these things. Why do you think domestic abuse goes on generation after generation? Why do you think pedophiles oftentimes have been sexually abused themselves? Everyone's trying to create some kind of unconscious homeostasis. At some point, we have to be mindful and stop that chain. And when you do, that little girl can heal up and you can begin to develop. But as long as you're doing this stuff, you're going to keep that abuse alive. And when we don't get our, our needs met in those primary attachments, sometimes we can turn to other things and have sort of an excessive attachment to something else. And in your case, do you see what you've done? Your attachment is with what? With opiates. You get into recovery and you get well. We will help you to self -soothe. I've been in recovery. I've been in recovery five times. For the sixth time, my parents asked me to get treatment. I thought, F it. What else am I going to do? Continue like this? waste away. I just didn't see the worth in myself. Debbie's story is not uncommon. With such strong drugs such as heroin and meth, many times it takes the users several, sometimes even dozens of times to get it right. And you know what? You'll always be in recovery. There'll never be denial again. Once you've gone in, you're in. It's not about being perfect. It's about being in recovery. The nature of the beast and addiction is you're going to fall off the wagon once in a while. And when you do, you get right back on. No shame. One day at a time. And Debbie, the most important thing for you to remember, you're not alone. And you're worth it. Are you ready to take that step? It's time. Hey, let's do it. <laughs> All 
right? And at some point, that little girl needs to realize that she's worthy of that kind of love and that attentiveness. I'm not sure Debbie's ever been attended to in the way that she was in our session today. It was foreign to her, but also I think there was something corrective about it. You know what, Debbie, today's a step that you're going to start attending that little girl and healing her so we can move on and get out of this cycle. I'm really proud of you. Thank you. I think I'm proud too. You're worth it. And you may not feel you're worth it deep down inside, but you are. And every little girl is deserving of that love and that attention. Every little girl. And it's not that you're not worthy of it. They just weren't capable of it. They were preoccupied. Yeah. If you don't get out of this, Debbie, you're going to end up dead. And you have for eternity to be dead. It'd be tragic and very premature for you to die at this young age. The only gateway association to heroin is not being a gateway drug, but being a gateway to the cemetery. You know, someone really loves you. They're going to care for you and not exploit you. Ray never really loved me. I really thought he did, though. I know you did. But what do you know about healthy love? Now? Nothing. Yeah. There was conditions, and that relationship was based, the ideology of that relationship derived from addiction. He used me. He used me in my vulnerability. God, he made me feel so bad. I felt used. I felt dirty. I felt like. I felt like. A, I felt like a whore. And Brooke, there's another thing I want to ask you before our next session. I want you to come to my office next time without any makeup, without any provocative clothing, without having to put on a show. I just want you to reveal the average Brooke, the normal Brooke. You don't have to put on a show here. Can you do that? I guess. Do you understand why I'm asking you to do this? No. <laughs> I want you to start to plug in to these other parts of you. I'm not interested in another part of you. I'm interested in your, in your intellect, your emotion, what's going on internally. And that's what we're plugging into here. You're going to have a different experience here. You're going to have an experience where you're going to come in and someone's going to get close to you. You're going to let down your walls and your defenses you're not going to be exploited. And my hope, Brooke, is it's a good outcome. And if it is, it's like a corrective emotional experience where you've actually let someone into your life, you're vulnerable, and you had a good outcome. I want you to be understood. I want you to be well. And I want some growth to go on here without all that other stuff. If I see you outside the office, I won't approach you, uh, so you have to explain who I am. But if I do see you, how was the meal? How was the movie? This is a sacred thing here. This is boundaries. I'll never try to give you a hug. I'll never try to be your friend. I'm your psychologist. And I take that privilege very seriously. Everything we stay will stay, stay in here. I'm going to show you boundaries are, something you've never learned from anybody else. I could tell him anything and have this confidence and that if I were to see him out on the street it, it wouldn't, he wouldn't come up and talk to me and, and try to make it weird. He would just, oh hey, how was, how was your movie or you know, whatever it was and creating that relationship for the first time in my life um, with, with a man especially, a man that had no intentions other than to help me. One of the most important parts of treatment with Brooke is to talk about healthy boundaries. 
It's such a privilege to work with these people who have been abused, and I will never violate that privilege of power. I'm going to give them a different experience and a corrective emotional experience that someone in authority that attends to them is not going to do them any harm or exploit them for personal gain. And I hope you can tolerate this. I know it's going to be hard. But somebody obviously cares about you and somebody wants you to get well. Brooke appears to be willing to adopt the techniques that the doctor has suggested to aid her in her own personal battle. Okay. The letter, the dress attire, make an appointment up front. I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay. Very good. Brooke is a trauma survivor. Brooke has been through some major trauma and abuse. What happened to Brooke is not uncommon, but is so wrong. It's part of my, my recovery, my healing, it's creating that full circle and, and becoming a more spiritual woman. My hope is after she goes into recovery, she's gonna utilize the resources we've offered her. And those resources will help empower her, give her skills, find other podiums for value. Other podiums are healthy not dysfunctional and dirty and keep all our trauma alive. I, I was on a completely different path before this and it's, it's very much helped me try to turn that around. My hope is that Brooke can begin to see that there's other associations I have with attachment, such as trust, boundaries, and healthy fulfillment, and someone that really cares about her well-being, empathy that she's never experienced before. There's been a lot of empathic failures in Brooke's life. I think the silver lining of all of this is for me to be able to use my experiences and put them forward and um, help others and help keep this from happening to others. I used to hate the way he would look at me. I use this tool. I think Debbie realizes her relationship with Raymond is built on pathology and drugs. It seems to be a relationship that there's exploitation, that they've bonded around this pathology of using drugs, and I don't think it's a healthy start. Like I was a person, not like I was a woman even. Right. When a man loves you in a healthy way, He's going to attend to your security in every way, emotionally, physically, financially. And he's not going to want to exploit you. He's going to want to love you. I have to get better first. Yes, you do. you got to get well. And once you're well and you're not needing this addiction anymore, you're not, you know, you get through the withdrawals. You get through all the, you know, you know what you're going to go through. And you get that clarity. You get healthy. And you get psychologically healthy then you might be a candidate to be in a relationship. But you have to get well first. Otherwise, you're going to have sick relationships. I think I'm ready. I think you are, too. If she doesn't get off this drug, there's only two outcomes, jail or death. I've never felt like this before. Ever. Ever. I've always just felt like a piece of garbage. You know, something on the street that somebody walks around. And I was f fine with that. Just living, just being, just feeling. I hear what you're saying, but you're so much more valuable than that. I saw, I saw this baby on the street. It's a daughter of a friend of mine. And this girl, she, she smiled at me. At me. I didn't see any reason to continue. Until I saw that, that smile. 
that baby smile at me. And I thought I'd done something. I, I've impacted somebody's life. You know, I've made a difference. And all I did was be. All I did was be there at that time, in that moment. And I thought if I can do that without even trying, maybe if I did try, maybe if I did really try this time, maybe I could get better. For the first time I saw I felt what it means to make somebody happy, really happy. It appeared in an innocent way. I think you saw a lot of yourself in that little girl too. And I think you want to be pure and clean again. I do. It's been so long. But that baby symbolized something very powerful to you. She showed me that you know, I'm, I'm not just a junkie. Right. I'm a woman. The baby saw that. I'm glad. I'm glad you felt that. Because this, this junkie, this drug, it's just a defense, it's a manifestation of something else and it's covering that pain inside that little girl, that little girl within you. And that little girl within you, your inner child, needs to be healed up. She's been numbing herself for so many years. I don't think she knows how to regulate her emotions. So this is gonna be a big challenge in our work. What's it like? It's gonna be liberating for you. You're gonna have a moment of clarity when you get out of this drug. You get about 60, 90 days out of this drug, you're gonna have some clarity, you're gonna feel some health you haven't felt. You're gonna feel a vibrancy. And you're gonna be liberated. This thing has had you by the tail. When you're in addiction, you can't, you're preoccupied. You can't love. You can't really put your energy in anything else besides the drug. You're grooming, you're lying, you're, it's interfering with your functioning. And we're gonna help you to deal with that anxiety. We're gonna help you learn how to self-soothe without drugs so you can be well. And we'll help that pain that you've been through as well. Get that little girl to grow up and graduate. I'm just scared. I know you are, but you're not alone. And when you go into a 12-step program and you have a sponsor and you work the program, you're gonna find out you're not alone. It's very important that she gets into a 12-step program she works a program, has a sponsor in the program, and gets clean. Once she gets that clarity and that health back, then we can really do some good work in her interpersonal life. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so worth it. The biggest breakthrough for me was the realization that it wasn't my fault. You know, had I had really supportive parents, maybe I wouldn't have started walking down the path I chose. I think Debbie needs to realize how important it is for her to get well. Dr. Corey taught me that there are other ways. You know, stopping, stopping in time, taking a moment for yourself, taking a moment for yourself every morning and saying, thank you. Her anxiety is stems a lot from her childhood where she felt threats to her security. She didn't feel a lot of security in her, her childhood. So it's very important that she learns other ways of self-soothing besides drugs. And one of parts of my work with her is to help her find those ways, whether it's cognitive, behavioral, meditation, exercise, but ways that she can really attend to herself. You know, I got in touch with old friends. They were so happy to hear from me. 
I thought that they'd forgotten about me. I thought that they had lost faith. But really, they were just waiting for me to come back. For me to realize that I am worth it. Debbie's story is compelling. You can see the emotion in her. You know that this was really a profound experience for her. And it's so great when patients like this have breakthroughs like that. It's what makes it all worthwhile. You know, one day, maybe I'll have a child. And I know I will love them so much. Always. I will always provide them with love, and they will know that they can trust in me. Thanks to the doctor, for the first time, Debbie appears to be making progress. Progress that no one in her family had ever dreamed possible. The doctor gave her several coping techniques to employ, which have served her well, so far. For all of those unfortunate individuals in dire circumstances, there is hope. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Don't give up. Thank you for joining us.